So her manufacturing setup. So what I've done is I've actually pre-configured some of the manufacturing, but I'm going to go over what I had to configure. So in manufacturing setup, we're going to basically list our default settings. So for our production, when's the normal starting time, normal ending time, preset output quantity, you got two choices here, expected, or you can do zeros on all operations or last operation. Usually it's expected quantity. This will come into effect when you basically populate production journals, output or consumption journals, if you want the expected to fill in, or if you want those to be zeros and you manually fill in. Show capacity. So here we've decided to run everything in minutes. You can set up seconds, hours, days, pretty much whatever you need to configure. Again, we're going to have to assign a number series for the documents we're going to be using in our production. These are set up in base nav, so we can just pull them in. So I can just drill down and find them in the list. And planning is not covered in this, but there's a whole section here that we can set up for production planning. So next, a good guide for setting up manufacturing is to actually go to the manufacturing department and go to administration. And if you notice, setups are listed in order here. So we've already covered manufacturing setup. Next, let's look at our capacity units of measure. So again, we've listed more options. We're going to use minutes, but we've also set up hours and days, depending on the length of time that a typical production order would have to run. So again, it's very easy to set these up. Basically, just press new, and then you can enter weeks and pull in a type of weeks. So pretty simple there. Next, we're going to have to define work shifts. So here I've set up two different work shifts. I got first shift and second shift. And then we're actually going to use these as part of our shop calendars. And I'll show you how to use those. So these are just codes to represent different shifts. So to show you how to use those so it makes more sense, let's take a look at our shop calendars. So I set up two different shop calendars. So I got one shift, two shifts. So in order to look at those, let's actually look at the first shift Monday through Friday. What times are they actually going to work? So I got first shift working eight to four, five days a week. And I've associated work shift number one to this calendar. Two shifts. So this is basically eight to 11. And this would be for a code of two for the working shifts. So the whole idea behind capacity is we need to figure out for a specific work center or a type of machine, how long can it possibly run and output in a given period of time? So for us, we're actually going to define how many days a week it's going to run and how many hours. So once we have that, then we need to exclude our holidays. So I just threw a holiday in here for us. So I set up Christmas, but we can go ahead and define our holidays for all of next year. And what it'll do is in a combination of work days and holidays from the machine center assigned to one of these shifts, I can do a calculation and it'll tell me all of our capacities in minutes, how many minutes that machine's going to run on a given day. So that's our end goal for setting up capacities. So before we can work on the hierarchy of setting up our work centers, the highest level is a reporting to work center group. We only have to set up one, but we can set up as many as we want for reporting purposes. So we'll set up one for inventory and one for production. You can see the calendars in here. So at the highest level, work center groups are going to accumulate all of your work centers times, add them up into one total. So again, this is only for reporting. Most of your setup is going to be done at the actual work center. So let's take a look at that. So we're going to be setting up work centers that we can use in our routings. So these work centers are basically defined by task. So I have an assembly department. So let's take a look at that. So I can just go over one of the work centers in detail. You can assign it a number, which is the code, a name, assign it to a work center group, 
Again, you only need one group. I put this towards production. Direct unit cost, basically referred to as your direct labor rate. So I got $1.20 a minute running on this. You can also have indirect costs and overhead rate. All three of these would calculate your unit cost. So I got $1.20 a minute. Flushing methods, we'll get to that. But this is for routings. You're going to define your flushing method on the work center. Capacity. So basically, how many production orders can I run through this work center at once? So we're actually going to change this to one at a time. But you can actually run as many as you want. Efficiency. If it's select machine and it's newer, I expect it to run 100% of the time. But of course, if it's an older machine, prone to breakdowns, power outages, maybe it can only run 85% of the time. And we attach our shop calendar code. And from our work center, if we go to our calendar, since I've changed something on here, if I go to show matrix, we're actually going to have to update this calendar. So say OK here. And it should recalculate this as 480 minutes a day. The reason it was 960 is because I had a capacity of two. I changed it to one. So every time you readjust your calendars, you're going to want to go into your work centers and basically recalculate. Quickly touch on subcontracting. All you have to do is create a work center. And if you attach this subcontracting number, let me go back to my list. I set one up here. The only thing that really you need to enable subcontracting is to assign it a vendor number. And when this routing gets used, built into a routing, this work center, it would require a PO to be generated for the subcontract. All right, so next let's take a look at our production bombs. So I set one up in advance for us here. So it's a custom table that we're building. Again, your production bomb is the components that are going to be needed to make this. So I got four components here in various quantities in order to make this custom table. Again, the flushing method for routings came from the work center. The flushing method for your production bombs are going to be coming from these item cards themselves. So each one of these components has its own item card here, and we'll define the flushing method there. You can have different versions of bombs. I'll lightly cover this. So basically, if we use this till the end of the year, starting January 1st, maybe this custom table is going to use a different color of paint, maybe by a different vendor. You can set up version 2. Its start date would be January 1st. When January 1st rolls around, whenever we go to produce this custom table, it's going to use version 2. Since we don't have any other version, it's just going to use the master version. All right, so next we'll take a look at routings. And again, for our custom table. So this is the steps needed to make it. So operation numbers leave some room in between operations in case in different versions. Maybe you need to add another step that will fit between 10 and 20, maybe step 12. Pull in your work center number. So 100 was our assembly department. For this, I have a 15-minute setup time, and it's going to run 60 minutes for each table that I produce. So if I make a production order that has two tables on it, it would run for 120 minutes. So that helps us define our start and end dates. So once we have a production bomb and routing, we would go to our item card and attach those. So we'll pull up our item list here. So here's our custom table. So let's take a look at this item card. So if we go to our replenishment tab, I've changed the replenishment system to production order. So we definitely wouldn't want to purchase this or assemble it. We're going to fully produce it. Then our production values will take to effect. Manufacturing policy, we've got two choices, make to order. 
So you'd have to have a demand for it to create the order for you through the planning worksheet. It's another topic, or you can make it to stock. And basically, down below, we can set up some parameters that would tell us how much we need to keep on hand at all time. And it goes below that. They would recommend a production order. So we'll just leave this make the order. So I've attached my routing that I made, my production bomb. Again, I've used the same code as the item number, so I can keep them all linked. If you're making units that are fractions, you can use a rounding precision, but it tables a whole number. And we have a flushing method on the finished item card. So real quick, let's just recap flushing methods. So basically when I plan my production order, I have to determine how I am going to relieve my components out of stock. So I got three options. Manually, I'm going to have to actually use a journal and record how much of the components that I've actually used, how much of the finished item that I've output. We can change this to backwards. The system will automatically adjust your inventory when the status of the production orders change from release to finished. Or we can mark it as forward. So basically, when I change the production order to released, it'll go ahead and consume all my inventory. For this operation, I want as accurate as possible, so I'm not going to flush expected quantities. I want to actually record in a journal how many I'm going to use. So that'll stay manual. So with these settings, I can finally create a production order. So let's go to release production orders. So I'll just create a new one here. All right, so the number series that I set up on manufacturing setup, this was one of them, release production order. So I'll press enter, I'll pull in that number series. It's looking for a source number. This is the item that I want to make. So we're going to make this custom table. So I pulled in my custom table, the quantity that I want to make. So let's say, again, I want to make two of these. All right, due date. So when do I want to actually have these output? So let's give ourselves a little bit of time to make it. Perfect. So the next thing we need to do is refresh our production order. And before I do that, it's important here to define what location is going to be making this. So let's use our white warehouse. So when I have basically the white warehouse, it will actually look for component stock there. So let's refresh our production order. This is not a flushing method. This is scheduling direction. So just a short recap on this. You've got two choices, forwards or backwards. So depending on your due date, if it's backwards, it's going to go to 1130. Calculate how much time is used on the routing. Plan backwards. And basically, backwards will give you the latest date you can start it, still manufactured in time. If I go with forward, it would actually start the production order today, finish it as soon as possible, and therefore, it's just going to sit in stock until I would actually ship it out. So majority of the clients go with backwards, just in time. We don't want to make it too early. So let's say OK. So according to our due date, the latest I can start this is on the 29th. At 10.45, it will take until 4 p.m. to finish these two tables, all routing steps. So again, I can go to my, look at my components. So I can see all of these components, the quantities, the location, and it's actually found the bin codes to actually manufacture these. So these are my production end bins. Since I used a different warehouse than Atlanta, those were set up with different bins. And again, it copied the flushing method from the item cards. So I can take a look at its component. Just look at components when you look at the routing. So this has all of our work centers. They all had flushing methods. And you can see what location they are, start and ending times, and the expected run times. So all of this columnates into 
basically we need to fill in our production journal, which is a combination of output and consumption journals. So this is where we're actually going to record as we're making this. We're going to record the consumption of each one of our components. So we can actually fill these in. So it's a manual. And the warehouse that I chose requires us to pick the components before we can actually fill out this journal. But since we're short on time, so again, I would have to basically create a pick. So if I exit this journal, if you go to actions, you would create a warehouse pick, pull up that document, register that pick. That'll put the components in the production end bin. Then I can go back to my production journal fill in all of my components that I'm using, fill in the actual setup and run times. You have the ability to use lot numbers, serial numbers, if you use your tracking lines. And then I would basically post in order to record this information in the production order. So if I were to fill in all this information, post my output, then my finished quantity would be two. I would have basically all my consumption. I would have all my routing steps, all that information filled in. I can see all of that if I were to go to ledger entries. So real quick, let me show you an order that has some. So let's go with finished production order. So when I post that journal, if you want to see what they look like, let's go to a finished production order. And let's look at its ledger entries. So you can see here I have all my consumption entries, how many I consumed, my finished good, how many I output. And if you want to look into your work centers and routings, that would be capacity ledger entries. It would actually record. So it looks like this one just had quantity output for each one of the steps but I can choose columns and add setup and runtime as well. So from your release production order, once you have posted all of your consumption and output, the last step would be to change your status to finished. So again, if our flushing method was something other than manual, if it were backwards, this is when all my components would actually be consumed when I change this to finished. 